go through and do introduction. Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario for November. Um, so we're going to talk today about leverage points. Um, and we have Ryan Murphy with us. Um, what you're looking at is actually um, a, a drawing of his talk that he gave at the RSD conference, which I think he's going to add on a little bit. So it's a little bit of a different talk. But what we'll do is we'll start off with the usual uh, introduction so people go around. And um, when I give you a call, uh, please introduce yourself. Um, usual question. Uh, OK, this, this time, let's do this one. Um, have you heard of leverage? So uh, introduce yourself, um, what your association is, and um, have you heard of leverage points, and how are you coming to that? Uh, Solomon, say hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to introduce myself. Um, so um, do I know about leverage points? Uh, I have a vague idea, and I'm here to learn more. Great. Thanks. Don. Oh, you're on mute, Don. <clears throat> Here we go. Yeah, I read the piece uh, by uh, Donella Me Meadows, and um, she made a pretty fair, clear statement about what he, she thought the leverage points might be. No, I don't think she got them all right, <laughs> frankly. But, you know, she wrote a long time ago, and uh, we have a lot of evidence now to show that other places may be at least as significant leverage points. Um, I also question whether that's the best way to to proceed, but uh, I, I'm willing to learn. <laughs> Thanks, Don. OK. Uh, Dan. Hey. So Dan Ng from Toronto. I came to Leverage Points, or I've learned about it actually from Donald Meadows. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't have as deep an understanding as Donald did. So I might be wrong. In, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> 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 yes. Okay. <laughs> you're very, you're very modest. In any case, I am also um, open to learning. Uh, we've been having some discussions around the value of leverage points in our uh, learning circle. So it'll be good to see how that all fits together. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Michael Troop. Hi, I'm Michael Troop. Um calling in from Guelph today. Um, I've read some Meadows and I actually uh, attended RSD 11 this year. Um, so that's that's what I know. Thanks. Uh, Ramez. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, Ramez, uh, with respect to leverage points, it's it's all from Meadows. And uh, I think I've read the paper by Ryan, but that, that's about it. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Griff. Hey everybody, Griff, uh, calling from Guelph, PhD candidate at University of Waterloo, and uh, yeah, all of my, probably 85% of my familiarity with leverage points is also Danella uh, Meadows, um, and yeah, really liked, I read some of Ryan's uh, work on his site, really cool site, if you haven't checked it out, you should check out his site, um, and uh, yeah, really interested to see what he has to say, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Zan. Hi everyone, Zan here. Um, I learned about leverage points uh, while doing the SFI program, and um, it was really the Danella Meadows works that uh, introduced that to me, and I just want to learn more. Thanks. Lori? Hi everyone, um, I'm Lori, and I'm actually calling in from beautiful British Columbia today. And um, I came uh, to understanding leverage points through study of feedback and developing lots of causal loop diagrams, and uh, then found Danella's Meadows, who talked about feedback as a leverage point. So that's how I come to it. And I'm in the health promotion, public health world. Thanks. Bruce, in from Oxford. Um, hello. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, 
let's see, my background is systems engineering and program management. And um, I came to Leverage Points through Donella Meadows. However, I studied Peter Senge and his Dance of Change and, and his approach to uh, finding places for change. And I think there's some relationship there. And from a systems engineering point of view, I'm very interested in the design aspects and especially around systems of systems, because I think a lot of the interactions is whole systems playing together. So that's my background. Thanks. Elena. Uh, hi, Elena Leonard here in Toronto, where all of a sudden it's down to zero. Uh, <clears throat> um, I read Meadows and also Frederick Bester in his sensitivity analysis uses a lot of leverage points. Although I think in his case, they are also associated with drivers like in SDD. Thanks, Elena. Seb. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm also from the SFI program, and I learned from Peter Jones and David Ng. And obviously, we read um, some Meadows, too. That's where I'm coming from. Thanks. Christine. Hi, yeah, I'm I'm in Toronto. Uh, also learned from uh, Peter and uh, through the SFI uh, program and uh, also learned about leverage through Don Ella Meadows. And I'm teaching systems thinking at the undergrad level right now. And I find the students have a hard time getting their head around this idea of interventions. And I'm just looking for new, different, alternative ways to think about it and explain it. Thanks. Kim. Yes, hello. So like so many people here, I also learned about it through the SFI program, taking Peter's class, and have revisited Danello Meadows' work um, multiple times since I integrated into my work. I'm at, I'm at the Royal Bank of Canada these days, the research. And um, I was at RSD 11, and I did get to see Ryan on some of the screens during some of the sessions while I was there physically in Brighton, but I didn't get to hear his talk. So I'm super excited about this additional opportunity to do so now. Thanks. Uh, Madeline. Oh, Billy me. Hi, yeah. everyone. Um, I'm Madeline Weld uh, of Ottawa. I'm president of Population Institute Canada. And of course, I want to get people into a conversation about population and its importance to everything that's happening on the planet. Um, as it happens, Zaid Khan reached out to me and uh, he had seen a lecture I'd given at KCOR and uh, he was going to happen to be in Ottawa this weekend. So we got together, we had a chat, and he mentioned the seminar to me. And I thought, okay, sounds interesting. And here I am. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice <laughs> to see you, Zai. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, Badra. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Badra. And um, yeah, uh, I, I, I wouldn't claim that I know like uh, exactly leverage points but uh from the topic and also from my interest in system thinking and by way of system thinking uh ontario and david ing um um and, and again from the description of the event definitely touches a pain point and, and the nerve in terms of like being able to properly cause the change or at least help make the change in a, in a small way at least that's what i hope for so yeah this is where i'm coming from and Toronto, and also from Toronto, Canada as well. Thanks. Say hi, Peter. Hi there. Uh, glad to join you. I'm a, uh, a collaborator and co-author with Ryan, and was really happy to see uh, this work presented at RSD 11. So happy to join again, and uh, to see what more we can learn together. And Zad, say hi. Yeah. <clears throat> hi, everyone. I'm calling in from still from Ottawa, so I'll be traveling back to Toronto tomorrow. Um, I also came to Leverage Points uh, through the SFI program, uh, through the systems work with Peter Jones, and 
it's one of those topics that I really, you really internalize and it has a profound effect on you. But then when you internalize it so deeply, you look at it differently much later. So I'm curious, Ryan, if the way you're looking at it differently is similar or, or is matching how I might be looking at it differently or with others. I didn't get a chance to attend RSD 11. So, oh, Relating S Systems and Design is the name of the conference. So Peter can talk more about that towards the end of the panel. But I didn't get a chance to attend, Ryan, so I'm really looking forward to this one. Okay, so um, I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to be watching the chat and uh, trying to facilitate the conversation. Um, I may be muting people on and off if I can uh, if I can watch that. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Ryan Murphy, who's at Memorial University um, and uh, is a former graduate of the Strategic, Strategic Foresight Innovation Program at OCAD-U. Um, so Ryan, it's all up to you. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks everybody for the eloquent openings. Nice to see a few friendly faces. Um, makes me nervous to hear from a few people who probably know more about this stuff than I do. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, take the spotlight for a little while and introduce some provocative ideas maybe. Um, and for the, um, to give you a bit of a setup, uh, if you did see the talk at RSD, this does expand on it a little bit. Um, what I'll be doing is walking through a little bit of um, Danella's piece in, in detail so that we can um, all be on the same page about it. I'll be talking a little bit about the different uh, maybe updates or advancements that we've seen on Danella's work since. Um, surprisingly, there weren't very many for 20 years, and then we've seen a flurry uh, in recent time. Uh, and then I'll walk through sort of the takeaways from the talk that I gave at RSD. And I've since, since that talk a couple of weeks ago, I've added on a few things. So even if you caught that talk, there might be a few more pieces for you to uh, take away today, hopefully. Um, the last thing that I'll mention is if you are coming from a practice, as some of you were, um, uh, from a practice perspective, looking for new ways of using this, I, I don't think you'll find a lot in this talk. I'm going to walk, unless, well, so first of all, you might get a lot from Danella's work because um, the piece is awesome. I'm going to be critiquing it, but it is a really sort of fundamental piece in um, how we change systems, I think. Um, so you might learn a little bit there. And then on top of that, um, there are a few resources, those advancements that I mentioned. Um, those papers that I'll be listing, I think, have um, some real key pragmatic takeaways. So you know, my best advice to you, if you're looking to use this stuff, is to look up those pieces and then try to think about how, how to use them. And of course, we can get into it um, in a dialogue uh, afterwards as well. Um, so all that said, um, I'm Colin from uh, Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, the home of and the territories of the Miquelon and the Bearatuck. Um, and uh, I, somebody mentioned, Al Alana mentioned that it's zero degrees in Toronto. Well, it's been like minus two and snowing for the past couple of days here. So winter, winter is here. Um, that's where we are. Uh, how are my levels? I'm, I'm sounding good. I see David yeah, you're great. nodding. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, then let us dive in. Share screen grab the slides. Um, if at any point, I can also keep the talk up here so I can see uh, if you have a sudden question that really needs to be answered or if somebody can't see something or need elaboration, please let me know. Happy to go into it. Um, so the title of this talk for Systems Thinking Ontario is Finding Leverage for Systems to Change uh, Towards a Modern Theory of Leverage in Systemic Design. Um, and the the sort of setup here is just to give you some sense of where we are in talking about leverage. From uh, 1820 to 1998, uh, on Google Scholar's uh, database of publications, we saw 116,000 mentions of leverage points. Um, and then in the last 20 years, uh, year after 1998 is a year after Danella originally published her work, there's been 700,000 hits. So um, that's a weak measure. You know, uh, leverage point is a term used in statistical research. And obviously also a bias there is that there's probably been a lot more published in the last 20 years than in the preceding 200. But still, there's something happening here. Um, we're kind of getting interested in leverage again, especially in the last couple of years. Um, and Peter and I have done a lot of work on system strategy and on a tool or a technique we call leverage analysis. Um, but as I was leading up to RSD, uh, RSD 11, I started to think about what leverage points really are. I started to think about Danella's piece and how it was funny that I hadn't seen anything in 20 years that really sort of built on Danella's work. And if you read Danella's piece in detail, and I'll get into it in the, the presentation, um, you notice that she doesn't try to uh, claim, make any strong claims at all. Danella really doesn't get into um, sort of this rigorous um, fundamental theory, and yet that is kind of what she maybe accidentally created. Um, so let's see if you, you agree on that. Um, so this first 
10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, we'll focus on Danella's piece and then we'll get into some of the um, advancements beyond that and some of the critiques and questions. So to catch up, what are leverage points? They come from this uh, this title, this article titled Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System. There wasn't a lot of discussion of leverage points in scholarship, at least before uh, Danella published her piece in a magazine called Whole Earth Magazine that was ran by Stuart Brand. Um, but uh, she, uh, like, recognize that there was this discussion in management um, and in systems about leverage points, but uh, hadn't really, that that uh, issue hadn't really been given a proper treatment yet. So that's the sort of fundamental idea behind this piece. And I'll walk you through a little bit of the story about where the uh, key sort of contribution she comes up with, the 12 leverage points in um, order of effectiveness um, come, came from. But to give you a proper definition, she calls leverage points places within a complex system where a small shift in one thing can produce big changes in everything. Um, so these are silver bullets, what Bucky Fuller might have called um, trim tabs or panaceas, you know, cure-alls. They're the heroes or villains who um, turn the tide of history, who uh, really capture uh, what's happening in a system and manage to totally subvert or change um, the direction we're all headed in. Um, they're also, according to the kind of way she talks about it at, in 1997, they're also kind of a mythology, right? Um, systems change agents, change makers, um, management scholars uh, were chasing leverage points, um, but they weren't really uh, nailed down or well-defined. Um, and so um, Danella wrote this piece where she argued that leverage points are actually usually well-known, but often being used to push in the wrong direction. So a good example of that is growth. And she talked about the creation of uh, we'll get into it, but the creation of NAFTA and the World Trade Organization and how all these organizations were really focused on enhancing and increasing the speed and the um, volume of growth in the world, productivity, um, and how um, even, and, and that was in spite of the fact that Danella and her colleagues had created the, um, uh, the world model and discovered that growth was actually going to send us into peril. Um, and so uh, we were taking this leverage point on the system of the world uh, called, that they called growth and shoving it hard in the wrong direction. And one of the reasons Danella got angry about the, the, in this piece and, and really um, gets passionate is because we tend to use leverage points counterintuitively all the time. Um, and in fact, they're often disbelieved by decision makers. And the story she tells is that Forrester, uh, Jay Forrester, the systems dynamicist, um, did a study on housing and homelessness and found that actually low income subsidized housing um, without job creation can create worse homelessness through the modeling that he did. And I'm, you know, we can talk about that in more detail if you'd like. I'm not an expert. I'm just quoting what uh, Danella said about Forrester's work. Um, but the point is, that was at a time he discovered this in the the in a model in 1969 when uh, low income subsidized housing was all the rage, um, and yet it was being it was all the rage because it was being created and built up. Um, and according to Danella in 1997, actually a lot of those projects were being torn down because that the rest of the world had come to the realization that Jay Forrester had in 1969 that um, or that low income subsidized housing might actually be a problem if it's not paired with the right other kinds of ecosystem measures and developments. Um, and so Danella, when she sort of got the inspiration for this piece, was at a meeting talking about how NAFTA and the World Trade Organization was likely to make the world worse, not better. Um, and she had this sort of internal dialogue with herself. Um, this is a huge new system people are inventing, she said, about NAFTA and the World Trade Organization. They haven't had the slightest idea of how this complex structure will behave in the future. Um, and this is almost certainly an example of making uh, or of cranking a system in the wrong direction. And then worst of all to, to Danella, the control measures that these folks were planning on using to make sure that it didn't go out of control are way too puny because they were focused on small parameter adjustments. And so the story goes, she got up um, uh, out of her seat, walked over to a, a flip chart, uh, flipped it over and drew the table you see on the left in marker. Uh, and a bunch of people were amazed and she realized that she made a mistake because she hadn't thought this through at all. She came up with these ideas and then she needed to figure it out uh, sort of on the fly. Um, and she writes, as I began to share this list with others um, after the fact, questions and comments came back that caused me to rethink, add and delete items, change the order and add caveats. And that le led to this list on the tw of 12 uh, places to intervene in a system on the right that we're gonna go through in more detail. Um, so that's the story of sort of where this came up with for the remainder of my talk about Danella's paper specifically. I'll walk through those uh, just so you have a sense of where we are and what they're what they're about. Um, and then we'll, as I've said, dive into some of the advancements since. Um, so parameters are the 12th 
place to intervene in a system, they're often paid the most attention to. Um, these are like rates of things. Um, but even though we pay the most attention to the, the parameters of systems, they actually rarely change behavior unless um, they go into a range that kicks off one of the items later in the list. So an example might be um, low uh, minimum wage, uh, the speed limit on a highway, or air quality standards. You can imagine that if the um, local streets on in your town suddenly went from a speed limit of 30 to a speed limit of 120, uh, you know, you would see uh, cascading changes elsewhere on these other leverage points, and that's her point there. But if you change the speed limit from 30 to 35 or 30 to 40, you're not going to see substantive substantive differences in how exactly traffic behaves in uh, that local traffic system. Um, number 11 is buffers. Um, these are things like the amount of water you can store in a dam. Um, and this measure is relative to the flows that are coming into a dam uh, or the flows that are coming into a buffer. Um, and so uh, a buffer is effectively the amount of things in a stock, uh, and they tend to be stabilizing. They make systems um, slow down and respond more carefully, you could say, you could argue. Um, to the kinds of changes that are happening to the system. However, on the flip side, buffers are also, uh, they make systems inflexible. Think about um, the amount of national debt or your current debt, right? Um, the amount of, uh, or, verse, or the positive version of that, your current assets. Um, if you have a ton of debt, there's not a lot you can do about that in very short term. Um, and so they tend to make, uh, yeah, they tend to make systems inflexible and, and harder to change. Um, and they're also usually expensive. It's not easy to build new buffers. It's not easy to just replace your current debt. It's not easy to build another dam. Um, and so that's why buffers end up in number 11. Number 10 is the structure and material of, of material stocks and flows. This is literally how physical things move in the system. So consider the road layout in your country um, or your, your province. Um, it's like not easy to remap the roads. Uh, and so the leverage point that Danella says uh, this really represents is the proper design of it in the first place. When you're first laying out a city, if you have that chance, then you've got a lot of control over how the rest of the system is going to work. But afterwards, um, actually, all you can really do about this is understand its limitations and how to work within it, um, because it's too hard to change the structure, physical structures ahead of time. Another um, example of this is the plumbing in your house. You know, it's expensive to change all of the different pipes and where they go and how they flow throughout your house. Um, it's a little bit easier to change how quickly the water may flow through those pipes. Uh, so number nine is the lengths of delays relative to the rate of systems change. This is how far away in that plumbing example, how far away the hot water heater is, how long it takes to get a new vaccine to market. Um, and delays actually often cause oscillation. So if you think you're, if you're in a shower, um, you're getting a shower and you're in a hotel and the hot water boiler is 10 floors away, you might have a really cold shower at first, then a shower that's way too hot, and then a shower that's cold again. And so that's what delays introduce into the system behavior. Um, sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. So um, it's hard to respond uh, with uh, to, when delays are present, it's hard to respond to short term changes um, because the actions take a while to get to the, the destination. Um, so that's number nine. Number eight and number seven are loops. Um, these are, for instance, um, negative, well, so specifically negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. Uh, we had some discussion of those in the introduction. Um, and a, a couple of examples of negative feedback loops are preventative medicine, medicine trying to uh, self-correct um, an issue with your body before it becomes a, a real urgent problem. Um, and an example of a positive feedback loop is soil erosion. The more soil erodes on the side of a riverbank, the less trees can stick their roots into the soil to keep it um, where it is, the more erosion you're going to get. So these things run away. Negative feedback loops are self-correcting, um, but positive feedback loops are growth mechanisms. And so, um, sorry, I'm having trouble with a tickle of my throat. Uh, so the strength of a negative feedback loop is important relative to the impact it's designed to correct. So if um, a consequence in a system, if a, if a, a phenomena increases in strength, the amount of feedbacks that you have to correct that need to be strengthened too. And then the way to control a positive feedback loop is actually to weaken how much it, it improves or how, how much it, um, the gain, how much it reinforces whatever the drivers of the feedback loop were. I realize I'm going through this quickly. If hopefully if we folks have questions, we can get into it in more detail. 
Number six is information flows. And this is literally trying to change who receives what information about the system. Uh, a popular example is there was a, and this is the story that Danella tells, um, there's a subdivision where just by happenstance, um, half the houses had their power meters on the back of the house in, or in the basement, and the other half had their uh, power meters placed in the hallway in the front as soon as you walk in. The people who saw their power meter whenever they walked in the door tend to have much lower rates of electricity consumption just because they could see what was happening just through the information itself. Um, so that's number six. Number five are the rules of the system. Something like everyone gets one vote. You can't spend money if you don't have it. Um, or everyone's muted when they join a Zoom call. These are so the rules of the system. And whoever has power over the rules has real power in the system. So that's who we want to pay attention to. Number four is power over system structure. So it's similar to who has power over the goals. Um, uh, the, this means the power to self-organize. So technology over time tends to self-organize to what extent or to what ends, who knows, but it does tend to sort of um, figure out what new innovations can happen if you want to call them innovations um, as a result of a bedrock that has just laid of recent technologies. Evolution and uh, genetic um, systems are self-organizing. They tend to correct over time. Um, and anything that can change anything else on this list is a self-correcting or self-organizing mechanism. Um, so the rules for self-organizing are how, what, who, where, and what a system can add onto or subtract from itself and under what condition. And if you can adjust that, then you have uh, leverage point number four. Oh, I'm really struggling. No questions so far. I'm gonna take a second and pour up some water. I see some comments in the chat. I think we'll handle the questions when you're done, because we're sure. Let's go, you just let's go to... down to the list. Yeah, let's go down to the list and then we'll pause for a second. Sure. Okay. You just have to watch me choke. Is the problem? <laughs> Ugh, my body's not doing a lot of self-correcting about this um, this cough. So the goals of the system are leverage point um, or leverage point leverage type number three. That means the third from the most powerful. Um, so, for instance, a goal of an ecosystem is to seek homeostasis. Culture, I would argue, seeks mimesis or um, imitation. Public businesses, Danella says, seek growth and consumption in service of shareholder ROI um, and try to consume everything. Uh, and uh, a good example of a goal she provides is from Ronald Reagan. Previous to Ronald Reagan, the quote was, ask not what your government could do for you, ask what you could do for your government. When Reagan ran for president, he said, that's not the goal. The goal is to get the government off our backs. And he said that so often and so emphatically that people tended to actually shift and it changed the um, public dialogue in the United States um, to uh, focus more on this idea of government shouldn't have anything to do with me. Paradigms are leverage type number two. Um, so a paradigm before Kepler and uh, Copernicus was that the Earth orbits the sun. A paradigm, perhaps before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, was that masks um, do not limit the spread of respiratory viruses. And we saw some fights about that paradigm um, over the past few years. A paradigm is shared social agreements about the nature of reality, what actually is true and what people value. All other aspects of a system come from its paradigms. Um, so if you have the ability to change a paradigm, and we'll talk about how to change a paradigm actually later, then you have quite a bit of power. But then the final leverage point uh, or type of leverage point is transcending power times. This is the power to realize that paradigms are not a, an actual thing. They don't exist in reality. And then that is itself a paradigm and to find the horrible humor that exists in that. So if no paradigm is right or true, then Donella says, uh, we may choose the ones that help achieve our purposes. And she says some other things about purposes that we'll get to later. Um, but if you have the, about, the ability to transcend paradigms in a system, then hopefully, uh, then you have the most power over the system. You have the highest leverage point that you can find or the most powerful leverage point that you can find. So that's our list of 12. There have been a few things that have happened since, and we can go through those now. But uh, David, you said you, want, you might want to pause there. Is that just to give me a chance to recover or... Yeah, I'll just give you, um, let, let's just have a, a few interjections. So Peter's had sure. some comments in there. So uh, Peter, do you want to uh, inject a little bit? Oh, well, the comments were to kind of build on Brian's uh, uh, kind of 
interesting suggestion of the other terms that might be considered synonyms for ways to um, think about what leverage actually means, the other meanings, colloquial meanings that we might assign to that. When we think about leverage within a point or an event, uh, um, a, a set of relationships where there might be um, might be a position where we will have more the, the maximum impact for the most minimal input. And so, yeah, one of the things we often will we'll see when <clears throat> graduate students first uh, get get a hold of this idea is that everyone wants to go to paradigms or transcending paradigms. And so there's often this flurry of 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 uh, of ideas about how to change paradigms right from the get-go. And you know, as as wonderful as and so people work on narratives, thinking that, you know, if they were like Reagan, they could change that paradigm. Actually, we don't use the Reagan example, but that's a good one, Ryan. So, of course, Reagan had impact because he was a, a popular and, a, and at the time a new president and people were listening to him. Um, you know, that would be a different context now. So the paradigms are different. It's not an easy thing. And we don't know that much about, uh, regardless of Kuhn. I mean, think about when the last book really was written on, on understanding, you know, with scientific paradigms. And, and, and that's so you had... Uh, you know, so uh, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and and uh, and quite a bit, quite, quite and, and a lot of discussion around that sense in the scientific community. But I think those are worth really, you know, considering the other metaphors and the other terms that we use and to see how some of those apply or not. Thanks, Peter. Uh, have you recovered? Uh, do you want to continue? Um, I think Martin Ryan? Uh, Zach, Zach, uh, Zach, 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 Zach. Uh, I was just gonna. Oh, I was just gonna say. You know what's? Um, I was gonna let you recover more, but places <laughs> to intervene in a system is something that ought to be highlighted. It's described as places to intervene, mm -hmm. and when you look at them, we start to wonder: Are these in fact places? And I actually do. Uh, my eye also has always been anchored to number twelve or number one. People order them differently, but the power to transcend paradigms. Mm -hmm. I actually I actually debate whether or not that is a place to intervene. It seems like it's something a little bit beyond just a place or an influence point. It's it's something else. It's something deeper and within. So I was just going to point that out as just commentary for a later discussion. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's one of the challenges that I um, sort of am angry with about this piece is so much emphasis and um, uh, pedestaling really is given to those last couple. But and as Peter pointed out, people tend to be drawn to them. And yet it's like, there's no instruction really provided as to how to actually do that, right? And in fact, when you really think about it, the, the power to transcend paradigms is a kind of metaphysical call for um, Danella. Uh, it's a really magical, it uses, uh, in fact, her description of it uses the word deity. Um, and so it's like, what are we supposed to do with that as uh, people who are actually wrestling with problems? And I think, you know, she was such a poetic and powerful writer, but I think she got a bit carried away and didn't realize the, again, this was a magazine article. It wasn't meant to be one, I think it ended up being. Um, and part of the point of this talk and the RSD talk is to really say, hey, we need to recheck this. And I think we can do a lot better uh, as long as we have a bigger conversation and a bit more, a bit more critical about it. Um, I'll also just while we're here take a second to comment on uh, Peter's point of the synonyms I think that that is really um, cogent Peter uh, it's uh, my introduction I failed to say that from David's original question but my introduction to leverage points was actually sort of engineering I was involved with engineers of the borders Canada um, and they were trying to teach its members about uh, the root causes of poverty and recognizing that the root cause of poverty is obviously a systemic problem um, especially when you consider it in rural sub-Saharan Africa and so um, they were looking for root causes and they led to this idea of leverage points, but maybe there is a lot we can learn from looking at these synonyms in other fields about how we think about leverage because we're using the same different terms to refer to clearly some of the same concepts. So with that, uh, let's pause the, pause the interlude, un unpause the talk. Thanks for the re uh, recovery time. Um, so what's happened since? Well, um, these folks in 2017, and again, you see the gap here, there wasn't a lot happening, at least as far as I could find, between 1997 and 2017. But in 2017, these folks, Absan et al., um, wrote a paper called Leverage Points for Sustainability Transformation. What they did was they took Danella's 12 leverage points and they 
simply organize them into four character, what they call characteristics of the system, parameters, feedbacks, design, and intent. Um, and so they, it's the intent category that I think you and I both have trouble with. It's a good paper. Um, and they, again, brought this conversation back into the fold, which is excellent. Um, they, uh, the other sort of key contribution they see in this table is they separated out um, the two kinds of leverage points in a shallow and deep, although they argue later or related authors argue later, as you'll see that there's a gradient there. Um, but I'll just pause there. So that, that's the absent paper. Uh, another contribution is that Kanye Kramer and Senge, um, uh, although it's, I don't know if it's Peter Senge, um, working with F FSG, uh, came up with this concept called the water of systems change, and they reorganized leverage points as well into these six conditions for uh, systems change. So they called policies, practices, and flows, uh, structural change, which are explicit things in the system that you can change. Um, they called uh, relationships and connections and power dynamics a semi-explicit kind of change. And then mental models, they called transformer change. Again, pointing to that metaphysical, high-level, paradigmatic um, change as this most powerful thing. Um, but I don't know, again, if they really get to that uh, the point of providing good instruction, good prescription on how exactly to do much about that. Um, another follow-up uh, is from Fisher. Some of the so these are two of the authors who were involved with the absent work. They took that original four categories um, or um, derivative four categories: intent, design, processes, and materials, and aligned it along this uh, sort of spectrum of how systems change. The explanation of systems change. So you see at the bottom of that diagram, there's causality on one side, on the shallow side, and teleology on the far side, so the deep side. And they argue that one of the reasons why leverage points are important to talk about is because they actually shift how we think about how things happen in a system from a um, deterministic perspective, which is the causal perspective, to a teleological perspective, which is let's explain or let's figure out why these things are happening first and let's cast that ahead and then back cast in order to figure out how the system is organized to reach that sort of goal or purpose which is a neat um, and maybe useful reframing of the way deep and shallow works. Um, so then there is this piece from Bernie um, where they took those concepts, um, the reorganizing into four systems characteristics and actually developed a worksheet for folks to use. And they, these folks work with the School of Systems Change. Uh, so it's a, a simple development on the top of the previous two or three papers where you can take this worksheet as an organization and actually go ahead and use it. And these are the resources that I mentioned to you at the beginning that might be really useful in practice. Uh, thanks for all the leaks, links, by the way, Peter. And then a final one, might as well tip our, our uh, hand as Peter and I, uh, we wrote a couple of papers on, along the line of doing leverage analysis. So these are ways of interrogating a systems model, especially a causal loop diagram in order to find potential leverage points and other interesting phenomena. And I think there's actually, at the time, we didn't really draw out these contributions, but I actually think there's a few really neat things that come from that line of work that really challenged some of Danella's earlier pieces. So we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. So that's what's happened since 1987. Again, I'm questioning this big gap. It was very odd to me that nobody really developed Danella's work in 20 years. And then we see this development of four or five papers and there's been more to come out in the last, uh, I think couple of months, but I haven't had a chance to catch up with them. Um, but they're all very derivative from that Danella piece. They all build exactly on top of the 12 leverage points that she, or places to intervene that she outlined. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, that's the table from Peter and I, uh, Peter and I work, um, my and Peter's work. So all of that is kind of derivative of, of Danella, and yet, I'm going to criticize it here. Leverage points, places to intervene in a system, actually lacks substantive evidence and justification. By Danella's own admission, she said, suddenly, without quite knowing what was happening, I got up, I marched to the flip chart, I tossed over a clean page, and I wrote these nine leverage points. And then she said, this list was not exactly tightly reasoned. As I began to share it with others, um, they gave me feedback and I edited the list. But that's the full extent of rigor that we see in this paper. There is no further analysis and no further sort of um, critique or search for ways of characterizing this. Or um, it's not even, I don't even know if it was a peer reviewed piece. I'm sure Stuart Rand himself read it and had some thoughts because he probably would. Um, but outside of that, you know, we're, that's not to say it's invalid, but it is to say that we should have probably done more with it before we really ran with uh, the uh, this piece is so fundamental to how we do systems change. 
as we've talked about already, it depends on non-actional metaphysics, especially those areas of intent of the system. Um, she's in the piece. Uh, she says, I've watched him wonder as a new leader in an organization comes in, enunciates a new goal, and swings hundreds of thousands or millions of perfectly intelligent, rational people off in any direction. She doesn't say how that works. There's no reference to um, papers on how to be that kind of le leader. Um, and yet here we are. That's the sort of prescription there is be that person. Um, and then this is the mention of deity that I, I uh, said earlier, um, when she's talking about the power to transcend paradigms, she says, if you have no idea where to get a purpose with which to transcend paradigms, you can listen to the universe or put in the name of your favorite deity here and do their will, which is probably a lot better informed than your will, which is, you know, all fine. She, again, she was having fun in a magazine, but it's uh, not exactly useful for, at least in my experience, in my practice, um, for the way we do systems change. And then finally, again, by, by Danella's own admission, it was a work in progress. She says, I want to leave room for evolution. What you're about to read is a work in progress. It's not a simple, surefire recipe for finding leverage points. And then, and yet, what have we done with it, but use it as a simple, surefire recipe for finding leverage points for the past 25 years. So this presentation is meant to echo her. She says, this is a call to think more broadly about the many ways there might be to get to systems to change. And what I'd love to see from this discussion with Systems Thinking Ontario is exactly how to do that. Um, we have a few ways forward, and these are seeds, but if there are other seeds that others want to plant, by all means. Um, one way forward is to rethink leverage in the context of systemic design. That's the, the sort of discipline that I um, hold dear. Um, and I, you, you can insert your favorite sort of discipline there, but the point is that Danella's work is rooted in systems dynamics. So it's rooted in this very sort of modeling, uh, quantita almost quantitative focus on how systems can be put into stocks and flows, and you can create computational models, and you can do things like predict whether non uh, low income subsidized housing is going to be good for homelessness, or whether growth will be the bane of the world with those models. And yet there's been a lot of critique and criticism uh, and questions of systems dynamics since um, you know the 90s and since the 60s when Jay Forrester was present. So maybe we can rethink leverage from these other fields. Number two is actually um, to go to those design and intent characteristics of the system. Maybe there is a way of developing actionable design principles. Um, so Danella says, when talking about how to change paradigms, um, how, she, she says, this is how you change a paradigm. You keep pointing at an, the anatomy, anomalies, <laughs> anomalies and failures in the old paradigm. You keep speaking louder and with assurance from the new paradigm. You insert people with the new paradigm in places of public visibility and power. You don't waste time with reactionaries, but you work with active change agents and with the vast middle ground of people who are open-minded. And that comes from Kuhn, who Peter mentioned earlier, Thomas Kuhn's study of um, how revolutions happen. Um, how and effectively that book was about how paradigms change in science, but I think it probably applies a lot to this, um, to the paradigms of uh, systems. A third direction forward is um, Peter and I, uh, the work that Peter and that me and Peter have been doing, um, where we're trying to find ways of building better strategies for systems change by analyzing the leverage points in a system and by looking at some other phenomena. I'll show you what those look like. And then a fourth that I've added since the RSD talk is um, to build on this notion of leverage analysis. Well, how do you know when you found the best leverage points? How do you know when the leverage points you're going to target are going to be the most useful or the most powerful? There's not really any stopping rules for that. There's no um, evaluative techniques uh, as yet. Uh, and so maybe we can create some frameworks for that and make it easier for people to know like, okay, because as we all know, if we work with systems, we can do the modeling forever. We can do the understanding forever. We can do the talk. Um, or talking to the stakeholders forever. So when do you stop? How do you know that you've done enough? And the final few slides here, I, I show some signals of possibility. These are ways in which we already know that we can go beyond um, Danella's understanding in 1997. So the first of these is that we know that leverage is recursive. We know now that leverage actually can, um, you can find a leverage point in a system and then you can actually blow that point up, that place as they had um, mentioned, you can blow that up into a subsystem and look for new leverage points within that, right? And so if leverage is recurs recursive, then you can keep tunneling in until you find something that you can work with, or you can even back out, zoom out, and find more um, leverage points on the higher end. Another way we know leverage is, is currently misunderstood is that we know leverage is relative. Um, you might find, uh, maybe you're trying to change something um, in a policy environment, and you might find someone with the power to transcend, transcend paradigms. You might find a Ronald Reagan that you can tap into. Um, 
Well, how do you influence them? They're probably not that easy to change. So let's find a relative leverage point. Um, say their parents or their teachers um, and actually work and empower and educate youth on the policy orientation or the direction that you want to go in. And maybe that relative leverage point is what you want to control and, and manipulate in order to try to influence that person and get them to change the way that their policies are working. Uh, a third point is that we can move beyond actually this core concrete concept of leverage points. There are other phenomena in systems that matter. Uh, an, an example from the work that Peter and I have done is, is bottlenecks. So a bottleneck might be if you're trying to change, again, a policy in a, in a government, um, if you don't have enough funding available to actually support that policy, then no matter how much you transcend paradigms, that funding might still remain unavailable, especially if you're in a um, in a government working with a government who currently is um, running a huge debt or something like that. So there are other key phenomena to look at, and we've looked at some other types that we also need to understand if we're going to construct um, high leverage strategies to create change systems. Uh, two more, and these I've added since the RSC talk. The first is that le leverage is narrative. And actually, this paper comes a little bit um, in Danella's time. They don't cite Danella, um, but they uh, are focused on how leverage points can change the way we problem solve. So it's by Gary Klein and Wolf, I forget what S stands for, sorry. Um, but the idea that they wrote up in this paper in 1998 is that, um, and they're kind of focused on the way artificial intelligence solves problems, but they say that um, leverage points give humans with experience the way, a way of seeing uh, useful places from which to build a plan, from which to build a strategy, instead of just sort of working through options one by one. And so I take from their work um, on sort of sense-making and problem-solving strategies that another way of thinking about leverage points is actually that it just creates a conversation. Finding a good leverage point is a way of engaging stakeholders and you know, using Cunningham's law, the idea that the best way to find the right answer is to say something that's really wrong and have all those stakeholders come at you and tell you that no, what you're trying to change actually isn't gonna be that powerful, that maybe there's something else. Um, so leverage is narrative. And then the final thing is that leverage is strategy as well. And I think um, what uh, we've done with leverage analysis and with developing uh, systemic theories of change shows that you can stitch together multiple leverage points in really intelligent ways in order to have a strategy that isn't just based on one, but is based on many and is based on that use of relativity and recursiveness in order to find strategies that hit all the points that matter. Um, so here's an example of that. Um, so maybe you've got uh, those two pieces uh, early on, uh, or sorry, those, those two sort of concepts, that bottleneck from earlier and the policy orientation of somebody who might be aligned with you. Well, if you can actually attack both of those at once with a single strategy, then you're much better off uh, at targeting that phenomena later on that you want to change. So I submit that our levers are long enough, that the main reason we can't change systems, the main reason we struggle is because we don't know where to put them. The question is, how does leverage actually work in systems change? We need a modern theory of leverage for systemic design. Um, and let's get to work. You can e email me after this talk if you've got something to follow up on that, that we don't catch. But otherwise, I'd love to hear from you. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, so we can take questions. We can take some from the chat. Uh, also, if people put their hands up. Um, Ryan, you could go off uh, the screen share, and then I can actually see people when they put their hands up, because I can't see it from the screen. Ah, good. Gotcha. Thanks. OK. Um, let's work on, let's see, go back to the chat here. Um, Elena had a comment. Do you want to uh, add to the conversation, Elena? Uh, sure. I wanted to uh, highlight the, uh, <clears throat> the Forester low-income housing uh, doesn't work unless you put in job training. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit too simple of an answer. The way they did it was very badly designed. You know, a whole lot of large apartment buildings all stuck together, far away from groceries, far away from work, or at least not very convenient to them. Um, whereas what works, you know, is much smaller concentrations, more scattered, uh, but also of the idea of lumping the homeless uh, into one big pot when some of them are working, some of them are retired, some of them are taking care of small children. Uh, 
Some of them have drug or alcohol problems. Some of them have mental issues that are not associated with drugs or alcohol. They're just a very complex population, probably much more complex than the average population that more or less is functioning in all, all or most cylinders. Ryan, response? Sure, so I uh, just wrote it in the chat, but um, yeah, I really hoped somebody would speak up about the, the example of homelessness because I'm, I knew when I was writing it that it was a reductive sort of 1960s example, but nonetheless, it, it is a good example of maybe a leverage point that's being pushed in the wrong direction, at least in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but I totally agree that like you can, it's a, another great example of a, of a systems problem, right? You can't just like solve homelessness by giving people homes. You need to think about all the other parts of it that uh, matter. So thanks. I, I just add, I think the big, you know, a big point to take away from Forrester was that just through probably, you know, he was probably able to, to, to work out the kind of loops in his own head because you can, you, you do mental simulations to figure out, you know, how you might structure these arguments. And, and so he was able to see the counterintuitive um, nature of it, just like Donnell Meadows was, was responding and pushing back on the kind of plotting way that they, you know, that policy people moved forward on, on, on NAFTA. So, I mean, there, most of these types of policies are presented as almost, you know, fait accompli, where there's, you know, there, there's there's a goal in mind, and and there's a strategy, a very linear strategy for reaching that, and so part of the, I think the thinking about identifying leverage points or considering um, unforeseen consequences, such as Forrester's insight, was in seeing how a, how any of our current plans could have, you know, contra responses that we don't really see when we're part of the group think of the planning process. So it's important to be able to come up with these types of arguments at the time that we're involved in those discussions, because things will move forward, whether or not you do a full analysis, you know, it's good to be able to stand up and say, wait, you know, there, you know, if, if we keep moving forward in this way, you know, this may not be the best way. And, and that's part of, I think, what where Meadows was uh, really powerful, and she even gives examples of this, of how she kind of had used personal charisma to intervene or try to persuade um, people. So it wasn't just the power of her kind of rationality. There's, um, there's a certain, <clears throat> I don't know, like, like you had suggested, uh, Ryan, there's a, there was this kind of, you know, intuitive, charismatic, you know, jumping up you know, from her seat and coming up with something in these leverage points, uh, you know, when she first sketched it out, that was just kind of an intervention in the moment and it, and it stuck and it became historical. And, and even when you look at some of the other references, they do not advance the theory of leverage, its meaning or, you know, unpack it in a way that like, if this was a physics argument, it would be torn apart. <laughs> But no, because it's in, you know, whatever systems analysis. I mean, if you look at even Klein's article, and he's a brilliant decision theorist, but there really isn't that much there. It's like, a, you know, it's an IEEE, like two and a half pages or something. You know, and it's just like an idea. You're right. I mean, it's really neat you brought that one up. That's really obscure. And Klein is great at that. You're like, let's publish something in this idea and work on it later. I do that. And he never picked it up again. I know he didn't. Um, yeah. He kind of did that with sense making, like these short articles. And they're brilliant, but it's just like Meadows. So what would we do with this, you know, now? That, that what can we, how can we really unpack this in a way that perhaps there's a, a rich theory? So like the sustainability transformation. All of those papers were about speculations around the current model of leverage points. None of none of that that recent work in sustainability, I think, you know, even even critiqued leverage points in the way that you you've started, you know, that you started to do here. So it's it's how do we miss this? You know? Yeah, uh, I'm going to invite Laurie because she's been putting some comments in, and then Zad, and then Bruce. Uh, Laurie. 
Oh, hi there. Yeah. Um, I just added a couple of uh, quick articles that I uh, that I know that have uh, taken Meadows places to intervene and applied it in public health settings. So I just wanted to, if, if uh, you all weren't aware that public health folks are <laughs> struggling with these same leverage points and um, uh, these are just two examples for your for your reference thanks Lori um, let, let me ask a question why do you think that uh, the public health has an interest in it is it uh, um, is it the type of issue is it the systems dynamics background or do you have any insight about or any um, thoughts about why the leverage points is an idea that they like <laughs> because so much of what we do isn't making any difference. So really looking to new strategies, new narratives, new, I, I really like uh, your, uh, your um, framework, Ryan. And um, yeah, just really searching for a better way of, of doing our work. Yeah. Um Yeah, Ryan. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there has been a, some other recent work in, in public health using systems approaches that, um, that I'm fond of. There's Andre Noguera, who is a PhD from Institute of Design, who's now at Harvard Public, Harvard School of Public Health, who's uh, one, of the R, one of the members of R, the RSD community. And he's used a number of these different models in in, in in arguments, not all of his work, though, when you look it up, is in public health. But um, also, Eve Pinsker from Chicago, uh, Un University of Illinois, Chicago, um, who's doing work in their doctoral program and encouraging. And she's you know she's a fan of these approaches, but she's using mixed approaches. So Ryan, I'd ask in terms of kind of how you're at the verge of almost like characterizing a set of characteristics that could lead to like a, a theory of, I mean, so a theory of what a leverage point is and how it works ought to at least be comprehensive, a comprehensive definition and a description that addresses all the places where it does affect um, impact. And you've identified, you know, some new ones as well, like, um, you know, they're fractal and relative and, and, um, and the narrative effect and all that. So can you know you might say a little bit more about where you're going. I can later. I know David has a speakers list. Um, uh, so I'll... well so I was actually gonna you you typed in something to Lori and you might right. want to ask because not everyone's reading that and just sure yeah. Lori, I'm just wondering if those readings that you cited from public health, do you know if they've critiqued um did a lot at all or if they are like the sustainability ones just building on it directly? I'm curious. Um, yeah, Ryan, pretty much um, building upon it, you know, um, can, seeing if there's a way to condense the, the, you know, the 11 into smaller kind of a little more practical ways to to talk about uh, practice policy and research in public health. So, no, I haven't seen a real critique. Um, it's just, yeah. That's what those two are. And I've got a couple more if you wanted to connect with me later, too. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, Zad and then Bruce. Zad? Sure. Thank you. Ryan, wonderful presentation and assembly of like a lot of work that I know I myself have been observing. And so thank you so much for putting it into such a distilled package that resonates quite deeply uh, when you're observing the systems changes field. Um, I think I, you know, I have kind of three points, and I think they go in increasing emphasis of what to be discussed. And maybe point three can we can return back to it. But the first one I really liked how, you know, there is value in understanding leverage points as an almost an introductory tool for systems thinking. And it was a powerful, it had a powerful effect on me. It had a powerful effect on a lot of the students. And I think just by reference of all the practices and communities that use it its utility is like admirable alone. So there's almost a way to contextualize what it can be useful for. And I think that that is deemed valid with the upfront portion of your presentation. And then I think, um, you know, not to 
insert only Peter in, but I know historicizing the, the, the sequence of events in history of what occurred in the late 60s and early 70s, um, there's, a, there's perhaps a way to almost understand why Danella Meadows was thinking in a system dynamics type of way, given the involvement with you know, the MIT. And Peter, you talk a lot about how the prospectus was awarded to that team in favor of teams that focus on social systems and other uh, ways of understanding um, the dynamics at play. And so I think to some extent she can be forgiven <laughs> or it doesn't, you don't have to say that way, but it's like, you can understand why Danella Meadows may have an influence in her thinking of why she articulated them that way. So another way of historicizing it to understand what's possible. And that's also another, um, perhaps an, 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 an added element of your summarized critique. I wonder if the historic side, like the uh, his, systems historian would add that. And that would be an interesting uh, addition to a paper or a body of work. And I think the third call is the one that I want to emphasize the most, and we can come back to it, talk to it at later at length, but you had a wonderful call on your slide about other ways of looking at leverage. And I think almost somewhat meta or ironically to take the transcending paradigms, we can transcend the paradigm of systems as space, systems as um, systems as objects that occupy a space. And in the system changes learning work that I'm working on with David Ng, Kelly, Dan on this call, um, if you look at systems as processes, then you're looking at then you're looking at systems that are moving through time. So they're actually not physically in space. And so you can still draw the relationships, but those are those are threads, those are lines connecting. And so then leverage points becomes leverage moments or leverage, you know, leverage occasions. These are opportunistic moments where you know when to intervene in a way that is most advantageous, i.e. relates to your strategic, strategic leverage points. And then the question starts to become, well, how do you do that from, because a lot of your critique also relied on methods, right? There's a lack of method or methodology to it. How do you do that? Um, and, and this is where the understanding of point two, historicizing Donella Meadows helps us appreciate the fact that like, she also did have perhaps a somewhat spiritual calling to this in her other works where she references understanding the beat of the system and dancing with the system and staying humble to learn. And a lot of that resonates with perhaps looking at systems, not as a space orientation, but as a process or time orientation and how you relate to it for leverage moments possibly could be really um, exciting and interesting. And I'm, as a side note, we're at, the, we're at a point in our system changes learning where we have to start to uh, explain and articulate these in more digestible ways. So I'll, I'll, you may see a call out on the SFI group, but uh, there could be some overlap opportunities on the future for these cross-pollination cross of ways of um, looking at systems and leverage points differently. Yeah, a lot, a lot I shared there, but uh, feel free yeah. to, yeah. Sure. Uh, David, do you want me to do call and response or is that, um, yeah, yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Sure, Go sure. ahead. So, so yeah, in particular on the last item, um, I think, and I said this in the chat, leverage moments is a great example of how systems dynamics um, really sort of constrained. It was a paradigm that constrained how Meadows characterized leverage moments at that time, right? So um, the example you gave about looking at systems over time is a, a great example of how um, that constraint can be shed and we can come up with new ways of thinking about this. And already, I hope the, the practitioners in the room can, can sort of think about how, well, what does it mean to look like? look for a leverage moment. Like what does that, um, surely we can characterize something like that. We can think about how um, it's when say there's a tipping point to bring in, you know, pop, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, pop psych stuff. Um, there, there's a tipping point, there's a threshold where a lot of people are frustrated with the problem and therefore there might be an opportunity to like bring that policy up high and hammer it home. At, um, and I, I, actually that has a term in, in policy called policy window, right? There's a policy window that opens sometimes for radical change when there's the right appetite amongst voters and there's the right sort of government structure and so on and so forth. So um, that idea of leverage moment is uh, quite exciting. And then on the other point, the only other follow-up I'll have with you was um, the teaching moment um, or the, the use of it as a sort of way of socializing systems is spot on. Um, even just like this introduction, if you've if you've been wrestling with a difficult problem for a while, suddenly somebody gives you the language of systems and you're like, oh, this is why it's so hard. And then somebody says leverage points. And you're like, oh, this is what I can look for. There's like three sort of steps there where I think somebody who's brand new to systems thinking can get a lot from this piece. Um, 
And I should end uh, this little diatribe by saying I'm surely not criti critiquing Danella Meadows and why she wrote what she did and when she, the way she wrote it. Um, you know, the piece is fantastic. Uh, and she had such a powerful way of putting things that um, we needed this. But the point of the call is we need to build on it now. Just one thing I'll add to the leverage moments um, thing is there's a there's an equal side of non non leverage moments non desirable leverage moments. So exactly. do you let do you let your opponent in the boxing ring just exhaust themselves mm -hmm. and you know do very little just to avoid and so it's it's a tricky balance because leverage moments implies that you are going or leverage points implies that you are going to do something. Mm -hmm. It's there, there's an assumption baked in. So when you see it as time, it becomes interesting and the that's where maybe the the learning sense part of it or the humbling oneself or knowing how to look at it and look for the right time mm -hmm. uh becomes becomes an equal equal design education aspect that is perhaps not emphasized in current curriculum yeah yeah uh, just a concrete example of that um i was doing a project recently with the world wildlife fund not recently a couple of years ago now um, and they were trying to use the pandemic and the, the conservation, the, the fact that the pandemic came from breakout, um, breakout infections from a lack of conservation, right? The more we go into our forests, the more we're going to see cross-species contamination. Therefore, they were making themselves relevant in this new pandemic world. And so there's something to think about there where like, you know, a food security organization might look at um, the... Um, cut off of a highway in Newfoundland where I am suddenly needing that grocery store shelves are empty as an opportunity to like reframe what they're doing and make sure that it really hits home with pol with uh, policymakers or with funders or whatever. So there's something there for sure. Good. Uh, Bruce and we'll have Dawn and uh, maybe uh, let's see who else we have on deck. We'll start with Bruce. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, I really enjoyed the uh, description of each of the leverage points. Um, the, the comment that I wanted to make is that when you describe places to intervene in a system, um, my experience as a practitioner in this area is that you really have to understand the system. And I spend a lot of time doing that before I pick up the leverage points and figure out where they need to go in. And it's the better understanding of the system to me that gives the leverage points more value. And that's the kind of trade-off that I see. So that I focus on in a system and uh, dancing with systems and uh, dancing with change. All of this is around getting the feel of the system and and understanding the problems and the changes that could be made. And then using the leverage point concept to help prioritize where the, the bigger leverage points are. But to, without a good understanding of the system or a system of systems and all the interactions, the leverage points get very fuzzy. And I think this is the, the main thing that I've learned in using and, and working with systems is the better understanding of the system, the more effective the changes are. So that's the, the kind of concept, uh, the comment that I'd uh, like to make. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think there's anything there that I disagree with. Um, it's uh, the more you understand, surely the more you're able to pick up on even the subtleties and the nuances that, that Danila is trying to get at. Maybe one way, one thing that you inspired just now is like, uh, and I'm sure that I haven't looked at, into it in too much detail, but the schools for school for systems change that worksheet that I showed you very briefly. Um, I'm sure it gets into sort of using these, using the characteristics of the system as a way of understanding more precisely, because I'm sure as you know, or as you've seen, you can spend, you can waste time in trying to understand it. Like you can always understand more, but if you're working on the wrong part uh, or something, I don't know, it's hard to it's hard to characterize this stuff because it is so nuanced and because everything does count a little bit and you never know where the insights come from. Um, but maybe there's a way of using a modern theory of leverage to guide the understanding, right? Maybe there's a way of looking for certain kinds of insights and um, being quicker and um, more critical about how we're going to intervene. But you're not wrong. Yeah, nothing. I don't disagree with anything you said. Hmm. 
Okay, uh, Don, and then after that, I see some comments from Solomon, so we'll come back to Solomon. But Don, go ahead. Oh, Don, your mute's off. Your mute's on now. There we go. Okay, right. Um, when I hear this piece, I am thinking, is the modern term for leverage points um, inflection points? You hear this all the time now. It's a new buzzword. But it seems to suggest less, um, less deliberative design and more, uh, oh, there's an opportunity. Let's grab it. <laughs> uh, I, I have a gut feeling that a lot of people would be resentful when they saw these processes in action. They would feel at some level they were being manipulated. And this could be very, you know, counter-effective. This could be very problematic. Um, and I, I believe a lot of people these days, especially, um, but they've always been able to do it, game the damn system. They try to make it work for, to their advantage. And they'll lie and they'll do strategic voting and they'll make protests of things they don't really care about in order to create a problem or a distraction or something that will further their own and their colleagues, of course, all of the people they work together. And they, you know, the internet has been problematic in helping these people organize. But I don't want to get into that too much. I think, though, that it, it, for systems people, maybe we should think less in terms of design and more in terms of discovery, right? As uh, Bruce said, understanding the system that is already there. I'm also one of those people who believes that uh, society is an entity in itself, which we uh, contribute to. It's, it's parasitic on us, but <laughs> it, it does a lot of things that we have no concept of. We don't realize when we do things in, intuitively or we think intuitively, but in fact, we're responding to social pressure. We don't see the consequences. And a lot of these um, uh, delays and inability to make change come out of this because society is defending itself. You know, the way a, a virus will cling, it'll mutate. You know, and it's, a, it's a perfect example that COVID-19 has per, shown us of just how forces beyond our, our, our particular understanding or control are at work. But I still think things can be done. I do. And I think education is a big thing. And you know, when you look at all the inflection, uh, the, uh, what do you call them, the, um, uh, the leverage points, they interfere with each other and, and, and they also support each other. So keeping alert, I think, does make it possible to make change. Thanks. I don't know if I can add much more to that. I, this, this question of inflection point um, as another system well, is interesting. It's a little sarcastic, I guess. A little no, 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 <laughs> but I, it I does seem to be where we're going now, because that's what, what politicians are talking about all the time. <laughs> For sure. And, and yeah. maybe that's another source of um, potential like uh, synonyms, right? What, what are politicians trying to say in order to catch everybody's attention? Um, I'm sure that there's other kinds as well as inflection points. You know, watershed moments or... Uh, um, uh, I can't think of any other stuff on top of my head, but there's something there. Um, yeah. But uh, shoot, what was I going to say about? Um, oh, and self-organizing. I mean, you're not you're not wrong. Yeah. They, the system itself, right. yes, is trying to do something. Um, and one of the key questions, uh, you know, that Danelle is arguing about with paradigms and with goals of the system is we do need to ask those questions to Bruce's point. We need to step back. We need to make sure that we're trying to understand, you know, what's the system trying to do? Because whatever it's trying to do is, is like the current purpose of the system. The purpose of the American prison system by many is thought to keep prisoners in prison for as long as possible, make as much money off of them, right? It's not to solve crime. It's not justice. Um, it's to, to, it's because the prison system is a business. And so if you take a step back and you look at that system, the purpose becomes clear and uh, that gives us mm -hmm. you know, a sense of what mm -hmm. the paradigms are and of what we need to change. But, and this is part of what we're all talking about right now, it doesn't tell us what to do about that, right? We, we can say prisons shouldn't be a business as much as we want. And yet for some reason that hasn't mm -hmm. been the inflection point. That inflection point hasn't happened yet. 
Um, and we haven't seen a massive transformation in the prison system. I'm not an expert. Um, maybe we have, but as far as I can tell, um, prisons still mostly work the same as they have for the past 50 years. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, Solomon, did you want to uh, contribute? You had some questions and comments in the chat. I did. Um, so uh, this is something that um, uh, I don't know how to approach it without uh, without taking a let's say too critical a stance on the great work that uh, Ryan has done. Do it. Um, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. So so basically, the, the my thought here is that. Uh, a lot of the systems thinking comes from, I feel, uh, this is just my feeling, uh, post-industrial um, sort of technological driven thinking. And if, if we take a step back and we look at natural systems and we look at the way that nature works, um, I think uh, that works in a slightly more, I'm going to say disorganized way than what we think of as industrial. So, so even if we take the teleology out of it for a second um, and just take a biomimicry approach to looking at um, the complex human systems that we create and analyze and try to leverage, and then you know, just look at how nature would do it if nature were allowed to do the same. I feel that, um, so there, there are a couple of paradigms that we can take, I think. One of which could be that we could decolonize systems thinking and actually go back to pre-industrial thinking for a while and think about how the ancients used to do it, right? So there was a lot of wisdom in, in what they used to do and they couldn't really put it down in terms of arrows and shapes and diagrams, but that's all right because they had a worldview that uh, for them it worked somehow. So So what I feel is that so one way is to take the approach of this very rationalistic industrial um, approach of trying to fix things by giving little nudges and you know trying to uh, look at leverage points, et cetera. The other way could be what uh, Meadows was, I think, getting to when um, uh, she said that, you know, uh, take whatever your favorite deity is and put it in the middle, right? Uh, mess with that for a bit. Or if you don't want to do that, just uh, go outside uh, and take a walk in, in the forest, right? And uh, think about how the forest would solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So, um, so I'm struggling with, uh, with this. Uh, my, my thought is, and this is just, you know, just putting my own uh, thought process out there, that the more we try to remove spirituality from our human built systems, the more we struggle with looking at the system in its totality. This is just me. This is just how I look at it. Um, and I just feel that, uh, call it whatever you want. Call it, um, call it uh, a basic um, archetypal system. Call it uh, nature-based. Call it deity-based. Call it whatever you like. But what I feel is that there is something beyond the industrial boxes and arrows that we think of when we think of systems. So that was the... That was a kind of um, challenge that I wanted to give you that I think there's more to it. There's more fuzzy stuff than what we would like to think. Yeah, thanks very much. As I mentioned in the, in the um, chat, I'm perfectly happy to hear from people who I'm not of the physical metaphysical bend, um, but I we need this conversation to include folks that are um, because it's just not a perspective that I can represent. So I would love to hear hear more and see some some thinking on that. Um, what I need though from you, if I can ask for a, a, a if I can make a request, is I need to know what to do with that. And I know that that is back right back to the post industrial perspective that you were criticizing. Um, but what I'm searching for in doing all of this work is if I'm talking to um, uh, mid-level manager in a uh, government who's just received a bunch of funding to, I don't know, um, enhance the education of women and girls um, in uh, a rural area of their country. Uh, I need to know how to help them find leverage and change that system. And that is like as concrete as I can put it. Um, and so 
asking nature what to do is a great inspiration, but I still, maybe it's because I'm so concrete and post-industrial, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to tell the uh, policymaker that I'm talking to how to do that either. Um, and so that's what we need. And I think there could be extremely valuable work to do on using that, on um, tapping into um, spirituality and on um, decolonization, decol decolonizing ways of thinking about this. Um, and ultimately, I think you can find really powerful ways of tapping into those those things and give answers, give resources to those folks. Um, but I don't know what it is. May I, may I suggest something? Uh, that would be culture. I mean, so rather than trying to address a particular mode of spirituality, I think your example was a good one, Ryan, that if you're if you're looking for, you know, a, a range of <clears throat> A range of uh, uh, policy packages and options that would be appropriate for you know a development context, uh, you know, and, and for the work that we were doing with, you know, the UN SDG. Um, it would be that different policies would be appropriate for different cultures, and different cultures are going to have inherently a different religious base or a different you know um, different available religions and and approaches to spirituality in their culture and so that a colonizing way to deal with that would be to try to you know impose a socio-technical regime across everything equally like bringing in aid and distributing that in certain ways and having different incentives and bringing in one laptop per child or something and where, where Salman is coming from and I think where, where you actually could connect what I'm hearing uh, the possibility for is just to suggest that really um, working with the culture that that you that that the problem solving is is oriented to is already um, I mean as 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 native as you can create this you know can construct the participation as as natively and as engaged with the culture as possible would would lead to something that you know, would lead to agreements and the potential for leverage that was appropriate for that culture. And that could indeed be religious or spiritual in a particular culture and appropriate for them in a way that analysts wouldn't have to interfere, intervene. They could recognize that that, that, that was true for that culture and that was part of their ontology and it would make a difference. And so we'd recognize that as being appropriate in the cultural setting. And that would be part of discovering the system too, to go to basically to go with what Bruce and, and Don were also saying. Part of discovering the system is discovering the culture that it's recognized in, rather than looking at it as you know, somehow to be part of a global system and we want to change this culture, you know, that would be a that would be a post-colonial, colonial or a post-colonial approach. Yeah, um, I have nothing to add after what Peter said, yeah. Okay, uh, Stephen, give your hand up. Stephen, I see your hand up, but you're uh, on mute. There we go. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. I was just sort of following on to what, Peter said there, and, and where does the system end and the culture start? You know, or is it, you know, is that part of the system or is that part of the bath in which the system swims? You know, um, so I think there's something there about where does a system that's been designed or being, you know, looked at in terms of flows exist in such a form that it can have system dynamics and then where are the things where realistically the the idea of a lever you know a lever something you pull and then something happens right so where that's not really quite the way to think about things like culture i mean and stuff like for instance ronald reagan so it could be that he changed the system or it could be that he introduced well, they sometimes call deontic cues. He, he, he introduced cues into the environment through his speech, 
which were then triggers for behavior. But it may be that it didn't, so it may be that he influenced the environment that was around with lots and lots of messaging cues rather than actually changing the system per se. So, and that's another question. So is, was the system influenced? The system didn't change, it just was adapting to the, what was around it, if that makes sense. I, I'll just respond quickly to the, um, to the culture versus system thing to say I, another, in another area of my life for my PhD, I'm an information systems person. I study ontology. Um, and so ontologically, there's no such thing as a system, right? There is no, there's also no such thing as culture. These are all labels we're putting on things and boxes we're drawing around them in order to be able to try to make sense of them in order to try to find the levers that you're talking about that we can pull on. Um, and so I don't have a solid response to, to the other part of what the points you posed, but I would just say like ontologically, there's no such thing as a system. There's no, there's no system in nature. There's no system in culture. There's no in between. Um, the only thing we're doing as change makers is trying to put, uh, you know, draw lassos around these things so that we can do something about them. And ultimately, um, it, maybe lever is the wrong way of thinking about it, but there are, to go back to that example, you know, there are nations where uh, women, girls don't get equal education as boys. And um, I think that that's something we need to solve. Folks who are working on the problem think that that's something we need to solve. So we need to find levers. We need to figure out the best way of doing it. We need to spend the least amount of money to use that um, original definition. We need to spend the least amount of money to have the most impact, right? In order to make that happen. So that's what we're, that's what I'm looking for. I see that Kim has her hand up and Elena had a comment. Let's go with Kim first. Yeah, yeah, hi. Um, I've got, there's been so many thoughts that have come to mind and I'm just gonna try and step into this. First of all, Ryan, thanks for opening this up. There's so much there. Um, I come at this very much from a practitioner point of view. And one of the things that just as a question, I know you're not necessarily trying to satisfy that sort of faction of the audience, but I, I was curious as you were talking about um, work and thinking that's built on Danilo Meadows work and trying to um, apply it in different ways and maybe extend the rigor if it wasn't necessarily there in the first place is more this question around um, what do we know of bodies of knowledge around the application of leverage points and the efficacy of them? And what has been what has been done there? And you may not have the answer to that, and I think it's perhaps a, a large question. But um, I think Peter, you mentioned something about this um, in the chat about the the role of the designer and and you know the effect of these these things we design. The other thing I want to bring up, and I think someone there's something in what Sama was saying that was triggering this, but um, within my context, we've used them as kind of thinking apparatus for understanding within, by immersing yourself, we all work and live within these contexts, right? Whether we're trying to change them or understand them or both or what what have you. And, and less thinking about it from a point point of view as a change maker or designer, but I'm in this system and I need to work in an effective way with these other humans. And so by taking the leverage points and using them again as kind of a thinking apparatus to understand what we might be able to do effectively with a group and, and essentially understanding the contextual and cultural, pardon me, the language limitations and exploring that within versus acting on. And so I guess one of the challenges I have is this whole notion of a leverage point is, is really about intervention. And I think that this is one of the ways we've gotten ourselves into such serious trouble um, because it's always this act of, you know, I'm gonna do this thing to this thing rather than the, you know, the exploring with and using them almost as a tool for understanding. So I just wanna put that that thought out there. To respond to that second point first, um, you can't pull a lever you're standing on, right? So um, I think you're you're right in that um, these ways we talk about these things aren't usually about coexisting or, or living with or working with. It's always about on. And yet I go back to that to that point about ontology too. Like there is the truth is that 
the second we start to observe a system, we're part of it. And um, when we pull on a, when, when we find a fulcrum and push our lever in and start to pull on it, we become part of that system too. And so I don't know if there, that distinction that you're drawing actually exists, that um, the with versus on. Um, so maybe physically, you can't pull a lever you're standing on, but systemically, I think you probably can. And I think we probably always are. And I realize that that's like a um, silly philosophical point, but uh, I think that that's my response for now. Uh, hopefully it makes some sense. Um, but the other piece that you talked about, this idea of um, evaluating the, of looking at how leverage points has been used in practice, looking at whether or not we've assessed them, even if we don't critique Meadows, and looking at that point that Peter raised about um, effectiveness and, and assessing whether or not we're using the most effective intervention on the leverage point we've identified. Um, it, it's funny, actually, one of the um, pieces I didn't get into RSD is actually focused exactly on this question. So I have a lot to say. Um, I'll try not to take up too much time. Um, but there's this whole world of studying design as um, the theory that we use to create artifacts and the artifacts that we create. And that is the world of design science. In information systems, there's a really rich um, both scholarship and practice of this idea of design science. And that is, it raises the question of what basis, what's the basis of the, the um, designs you're creating? Why can you justify why this design is the best design, is the right answer in the situation? And then the second question, or the, sec the sort of second layer on that, there's a lot more to it, but the second layer I would add right now is, how do you know it's working? What kind of tests can you put out there right now in a scientific sort of way to say, here's your hypothesis about why this design is going to create the artifacts we need, the interventions we need to change the system the way we need, and here's how we'll know it. And so there's an evaluative framework there that exists. And I think we need to see a systemic design science. I think we need to see a language for understanding the theory that goes behind these interventions and um, being able to criticize it because the reality is like, you know, if, uh, to, to take a quick tangent in medicine, ethics is the number one question. You don't act on a patient before the patient's consented. You don't um, give uh, a treatment that hasn't been tested. You can't even test a treatment if you haven't gone through the most rigorous kind of ethical evaluation ever. And yet I think that the work we're doing is far more sensitive to um, these kinds of ethical questions and these questions of rigor. And yet we don't see that level of rigor. So I really want to see more of a design science in systemic design. I really want to see a bigger sort of use of these kinds of evaluative frameworks and these stakes in the ground so that we can gently work with each other to make sure that they're as best as they possibly can be. Because the work that we're doing is is so consequential. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, I think, I think your, your response to the first question kind of extends in a way your response like I would almost apply it to the second question as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, intervention. questioning the intervention before you make it. Mm -hmm. Before you jump on it. Yeah. 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 yeah Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to Elena and I saw Seb's hand flash up. I was, I'm not sure whether he's gonna be next, but we're gonna have last calls after that. So um, uh, Elena, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to put the idea of a, a project being something that you have to design with instead of essentially, you know, bringing it and like cargo culture. And it really is the same point that Kim was making in a slightly different way. Uh, but there's one, uh, one example that I have, which is kind of interesting, is uh, from a friend who's working in Colombia in a... Uh, a poorer population, uh, some charitable group came down with some some material that they didn't need, couldn't use, didn't want. Uh, but the local women actually got something out of that because they looked at the uh, bags that the women who were part of this uh, charitable effort were carrying and realized that they could make that kind of bag very easily with local materials and that this provided a new mini industry. So the original aim of the charitable group um, was completely off the mark, but they got something out of it anyway. And I think one of the things that it's possible to design for is 
to have opportunities for people to pick up on on other things instead of just having it happen as serendipity. Ryan? Uh, it, I don't have much to add other than it sounds like a, an excellent example of um, paradigms, um, really, right? It's like this assumption that we need to look elsewhere for the materials and how we can use that um, that acknowledgement of that paradigm as a way of subverting and building something new. But uh, yeah, thanks for the example. Uh, Seb, did you actually have your hand up or was that just a flash? <laughs> I was really just um, supporting Kim's statement on kind of like this intervention point. Um, I didn't really have much to add other than I'm thinking of the leverage point as a point where force is applied. It might be not like the most effective place in the system to intervene, but where you would have the most impact. And maybe thinking of, well, if I wedge my door open, at some point I break it. Um, so are these also points where we should be conscious of how much force we're applying to? Um, that's just kind of where I'm thinking right now. Uh, I think that's Thanks. a great example of the um, different types of other phenomena that Peter and I have gotten uh, into a little bit. Um, we I forget the exact term we put on it, but you might identify a leverage point. Um, say you've identified a, to try and play with that idea from earlier, a deontic cue that you could use to try and provoke a paradigm shift, right? Um, so you've identified that cue. Um, but the question is, you know, where do you act on it? And say you've got a model, and I always think in causal loop diagrams, but say you've got a model, you can see that that leverage point that you want to get at, that paradigm shift, like four or five different, um, four or five jumps down the chain. Um, and where you're working is something else, right? And so there's a question of locus of control, for instance, and maybe that's another key phenomena to talk about and think about. What are the phenomena, if you've modeled that system, what are the phenomena in the system that you and the allies that you're working directly with can directly influence? And that's your locus of control. And then the question is, how do you chain actions, that for the force that you're able to apply from there to the leverage points and from the leverage points to the things that you want to change in the system. Um, and that's an, a, a sort of really neat, neat visual way of um, creating what we call strategy trees, where you get this sort of root, the roots are the actions, the forces you're able to apply. The trunk of the tree is the chain up towards the leverage points that you're trying to make. And the branches of the tree are the goals that you're looking at to try and change. And you can take a causal loop diagram and use that to draw those trees. And it makes for a really neat way of thinking about um, strategy. At least I think so. Thanks. Uh, just before we close, so Badra gave, uh, I think it's four paragraphs. I don't know if they're four ideas or one idea, but uh, Badra, do you want to break it down a little bit? Yeah, sure, David. Don't worry, it's just one idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just quickly. Um, um the 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 two or three comments around uh, understanding and how much actually understanding we should be investing and how far we should go with that and that combined with uh like versus actually getting on the ground and doing something or get ourselves actually to try something and experiment and how this can can even deepen the understanding itself in addition to making progress and finally the, the third comment was about the um uh, like when Ryan said that, however, like no matter what, even if there was an error or something, but at least we're making progress towards direction, like focusing on leverage points means that even if we're, we didn't make that much progress, but still it's in in in, in the most effective direction, if you can say that. It just uh, reminded me of, of something I've been pondering recently where I, I, I start to be concerned that at least myself, but maybe generally the, the, the collective effort of, of us here in this group and also generally whoever like learning or adopting system thinking. Uh, um, thinking of leverage points as a magic wand, either consciously or subconsciously, where like we might just unintentionally, because of the human nature, we tend to shortcuts. So thinking of it as as 
magically things will just change and, and like overnight we can make a change of course not not with that <laughs> exaggeration but at least to some extent and my concern about that at least for myself is the on one hand or actually one is the disappointment that may actually result of result from not necessarily seeing the change or or, uh, or making not being able to magically uh, make the influence or the or the changes that I was expecting or hoping for. And secondly, uh, this may also lead to um, um, like the, the maybe the misconception or, or the dismissal of our responsibility and our commitment, or at least the understanding of how much work or actually doing the work that is needed to make that change, like dismissing our own responsibility of that. Yes, after we identify the leverage point, whether they right or wrong or correct or not, or whether we have disagreements. But this is just the first step. We still need to do a lot of work and change not necessarily will happen overnight. And finally, like how, how like what I want to get from there for answering Ryan's questions, like what we can do with that, or try and the rest of the group can do with that, is understanding that having like it may provide the stamina on one hand, and also understanding that at least by identifying or working on identifying the leverage points, we are at least reducing the waste and making sure that whatever effort is being put or invested, even if, even if it's not 100% correct or, or, or useful in the short term, but at least it, it's on the most effective areas and hopefully eventually it's on, on it's on in a good direction and eventually will cause uh, the influence or at least a positive impact on the system. And I will stop here so I don't ramble more than that. Uh, that's relatively in a nutshell what, what I had in my mind. I, I think that that was a fantastic concluding sort of uh, question or point. Um, and I, I hate to be a salesperson, but I do think that the work that Peter and I have been doing on systemic theories of change points exactly to what you're talking about. Um, because the idea there is to try and use conventional, um, a con conventional sort of program evaluation tool called theories of change, um, mm -hmm. but put them in a systemic context. So basically, our goal with that work is to make sure we have a deep understanding of how system, what, what our theory of systems change, why we think the system will change. And mm -hmm. from that, you develop a systemic theory of action, which is the theory of how your actions, again, going back to that idea of a strategy tree, how your actions root a tree that will grow into the modifications you need to see. Um, and the key thing there is, uh, and I think it's a point that you made in the chat, but you didn't quite get to in your discussion, um, is we really need our stakeholders, our clients, our partners to understand how slow this stuff might be. And again, yeah. to go back to the conversation Kim and I had, how do you know um, that your interventions are working? You need to be able to see that full chain so you can identify those earlier sort of points where the forces you're applying to the system are starting to have an impact, even though you know poverty is not gone. But you want to have some sense of that long chain of events that will see that impact on poverty happen over time. Um, and so I think that there is a really useful tool there in the idea of systemic theories of change in action in trying to be um, deeply critical of our own work and also um, through that criticality, um, deeply understand how exactly change will happen so we can be as confident as we possibly can be. That's amazing, Ryan, and I believe also you don't need to apologize or even think of that as a sales <laughs> pitch or something mm -hmm. because we, like, at least from the point we're discussing itself, like, even if uh, I personally didn't agree completely with, with something in that, and which is not true, I'm just giving an example, at least it's, a, again, a step in, the, in a good direction that we will get something positive out of it and then maybe we can build on top of or even decide that this doesn't work and move on quickly and play, fail fast, if you can say that, but also, mm -hmm. like, Maybe I would like to expand on the point about the stakeholders you mentioned, which is I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. my, my concern, or even like I would see even uh, a more dangerous than that, it's exactly our own understanding of the the, the gap or, or the delay in the feedback, and also our own understanding of how slow this process can be. Because if we don't, if we ourselves or the change agent, the group of change agents themselves don't understand that, I believe like we cannot blame stakeholders if, if they have mm -hmm. that misconception. Mm -hmm. They can blame us, though, which is why we need to be careful. <laughs> exactly. And, and again, to, to your point about like how this whole process, and maybe I will adopt uh, like some 
terminology from Peter Sanji's fifth discipline, mm-hmm. the book about fifth discipline, like the, the, the delay in the feedback loop, which is something I, um, I learned recent, recently, but others think more about it, which is you mentioned right now. One is to understand how slow the process might be. And two, of course, like regardless of the delay, we need to make sure or we need to have some indication so that we, we know that we're staying on course. But also I, and, and like another major threat, which is because of that delay, we might misattribute some of the changes to the mm-hmm. completely wrong uh, factors or actions and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe that's also another like point you, you like came to my mind and you reminded me of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To keep in mind as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so Ryan has given an invitation to everyone uh, to email him with ideas. Uh, I'd like to close this session. Um, for December, we don't have a System Thinking Ontario uh, session because um, of holidays. In January, I'm already working on a speaker and maybe one in February already. So uh, we'll see everyone. Uh, you'll see the announcements coming out in January. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. David. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, we'll post the video and let people know about it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and, and David, uh, I know that you're going to do, but just double check, please. Let's save the chat because <laughs> there has been a lot, lots of things that I'd like to get back to. Yeah, we'll work on it. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have a follow up or something with the uh, video and the chat or a short file. It'll hopefully be it'll be in the recording, so I'll I'll download it and I'll send it to um I'll send it to everyone or I'll send it to oh. David You're as coordinator. Right. Yeah, so oh, it's recording cool. to this. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone. Take care. <laughs>